Okay, the next panel is called Radioactive. If you follow the music and technology issues, you've no doubt stumbled across this debate about internet royalty rates, which we started earlier today. We heard from Tim Westergren from Pandora, who's uh, amongst many, uh, some organizations pushing for a change in the standard used to determine rates for webcasters. During this panel, we'll hear from other voices who say the switch would have a, rel a huge negative impact on artist compensation. Like is the case with many pieces of legislation, there are a lot of moving pieces to the recently introduced Internet Radio Fairness Act, which is why we've assembled this panel to discuss it today, to not only bring you know, the specifics to the bill would do, but also the concept of fairness in broadcast royalties in general. Please join us in welcoming Kurt Hansen, CEO of AccuRadio and the publisher of Rain, the radio internet newsletter, David Lowry from the University of Georgia and the bands Cracker and Camp Event Beethoven, Michael Petricone, Senior Vice President of Government Affairs at the Consumer Electronics Association, Patricia Pollock of Counsel at Breedhoff and Kaiser um, and Associate General Counsel of the American Federation of Musicians, and Colin Rushing, General Counsel of Sound Exchange, Chris Richards, pop music critic at the Washington Post, will moderate this discussion. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Um, I was asked to do this kind of at the last minute, and this is an issue that I'm not as familiar with as I wish I was. So hopefully my ignorance will reflect your curiosity about uh, how this works. Um, so just imagine that a child is up here asking these people questions, and then and if that doesn't work out, well, uh, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes, you guys can show me the flag, and we'll turn the questions over to you, and we can get down to the bottom of this uh, pretty, what seems like a pretty naughty issue. So um, K-N-O-T-T-Y. Um, so, uh, tell, you know, Internet Radio Fairness Act, this is a bill that was introduced on Capitol Hill uh, earlier this summer. It seeks to abolish the current royalty rate setting for webcasters, and instead it wants to base those rates on webcasters' gross revenue, from what I understand. Um, Pandora and Clear Channel are on one side. They're behind this because it's going to save them money, um, but artists might not be down with it. Um, this is, could mean less revenue for them. Obviously, streaming royalties are becoming a growing source of income for musicians in a struggling uh, marketplace and climate. Um, and basically, it seems like... W Maybe some folks are searching for some consistency among platforms. So I guess my first question, I will, uh, since uh, Michael is the first guy that I met today when I walked in the door, I'll turn it to him first. Can you just tell us, you know, from your vantage point, what is this, what is the radio, uh, the Internet Radio Fairness Act? What will this legislation do? Um, are you, do you support it? Do you not? And we'll kind of volleyball it around from there. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I, I represent the Consumer yeah. Electronics Association. Uh, we are the voice of the tech industry in D.C. We represent manufacturers. We represent online services. We represent internet radio services. We represent the uh, uh, retailers, brick and mortar retailers and online retailers. So pretty much if you're anywhere in the tech chain, we represent you. We're also the ones that put on the international CES every year in Las Vegas, to which everybody's invited to. We'd love to see you there. It's a, it's a fantastic show. Um, for us, we have an interest in seeing a vibrant, online, sustainable music economy. Right, uh, because all of our members benefit with their hardware members, with their streamers. Um, you know, we're interested in royalties getting paid, musicians getting paid, and in a sustainable, healthy online music economy. You don't have that today. Uh, you know, if, if, if you if you look at Pandora, who is one of our members, um, they have 75% of the online music market. Um, in part, they have that because they're good, but not just because they're good. It's because that under the current royalty system, you would have to be nuts to get into this marketplace. Uh, and that, that's not a healthy place to be. And what we hope to see is you rationalize the royalties, you make it more of a reasonable business proposition, there's more investment, there's more services, and, and you know, in the end, the objective isn't to have a Pandora, it's to have a hundred Pandoras or a thousand Pandoras and to have an ongoing healthy ecosystem of businesses that, that pay money to, to musicians. And we hope that by rationalizing the royalty structure, uh, you know, right now it's, it's, it's um, the royalties were put into place when internet music was, was uh, had, had just come about. Um, and the royalties were put into place by, back primarily by record label lobbyists, who at that point saw the internet music structure as a, as a competing distribution platform. And they put in royalties that were discriminatory. So if you're, if you're cable, you're paying five or 10. If you're satellite, you're paying five or 10%. If you're an online streamer like Pandora, you're paying over 50% of your revenues and royalties. And uh, you know, I'm not going to opine as to whether that's like a sustainable business model, but a lot of smart people have, and I would encourage you to, to 
get on the internet and look around. It's, it's, it's very tough to have a sustainable business that way. And what we hope this legislation does is put things on a sustainable, on a sustainable footing so we can go forward with this business model in the future. Colin Rushing, I met you second today. Uh, that's how we're doing it here. <laughs> um, for or against this bill, and why? And, and from what you just heard, what's your stance on this? Sure. So we are against the bill. So I'll just say that the um, the the. So here's the basic background for those who don't know. So we're talking about basically the rules of the road for the statutory license for the use of sound recordings. So what's a statutory license? It's something the government gave to services like Pandora. You know, for most um, digital, most types of digital music services like Spotify's on-demand service, Apple for iTunes, they have to go and negotiate with thousands of different record labels to, to get the rights that they need to sound recordings. But for digital radio, Congress said, you know what, you, don't, you do not have to go to thousands of individual record labels. We're going to give you a license. So you, you have a one-stop shop to get all the rights you need to those sound recordings. Um, so Sound Exchange's role in all of this is we're the organization that collects and distributes the royalties that are owed by these services to this one-stop shop. We are, in, you know, in effect, the one-stop shop. And we also advocate for record labels and recording artists in the proceedings to set the rates that are charged by this one-stop shop. And all we say is, you know, the rate should be a market rate. It should be a willing buyer, willing seller rate. And that's what current law provides for webcasters. Um, and really, it provides for everyone who uses the statutory license except for three services, three grandfathered services. There are over 2,000 licensees who are under this willing buyer, willing seller standard. Um, you know, and our view is that everyone should be under the same rule. It should just be at a market rate, willing buyer, willing seller. What the so-called Internet Radio Fairness Act would do is it would lower everyone to a lower standard, to a below market rate. And we think that's fundamentally unfair. If your stuff, you know, if, you, if you're an artist, you're a record label, if you don't have any choice in whether or not a service can use your recordings, at a minimum, you should be paid a market rate. Trisha, I'll move it over to you. And maybe you can also explain the artist's stake in, uh, in this entire debate as well. Um, well, sure. So um, Colin has explained the, the compulsory license. And I would like to just kind of go not to talk so much about the rate, but to talk a little bit more about the compulsory license, because I think that in part um, helps to explain the union point of view and the artist point of view on some other aspects of this bill. So the compulsory license um, is, is something that the unions back in the early 1990s worked very hard and the artists worked very hard to shape into something that worked very well for the artist community. Um, we, so the digital performance right um, it was established with a compulsory license that says by matter of law that 50 percent of the royalties are payable to performing artists on the sound recordings, 45 percent of that to the royalty artists, and 5 percent to the non-featured or session musicians and vocalists. So one feature of the compulsory license is that there's, a, you know, it's set up so that half of the royalties go to performers. That's obviously a really good thing for performers. And another thing that we set up, um, and, and we worked really hard to obtain, was that when the royalties would go to performers, that they would be non-recoupable. That is, that this would be a new income stream from the digital performances that would go straight to artists. It wouldn't flow through, uh, to artists through their labels or through any other, you know, kind of mechanism that would suck up some of the royalties, but it would be something new that would go right to artists and they would have it. It wouldn't be recoupable. And to help implement the non-recoupability, we worked hard to obtain direct payment of the artist share to performers. Um, and we did that first through sound exchange kind of agreements with the labels in sound exchange. And later in the statute, we actually got a provision that said that there would be direct payment of the artist share to, to artists. Um, so the compulsory license, along with all the benefits that it gives to the uh, music services, that is the one-stop shop, 
shopping that Colin was talking about in the ease of licensing. It's also set up to do, provide all these benefits to performers, that is direct payment, non-recoupability, and it's all administered through Sound Exchange, which is an organization that artists have a 50% control over because artists sit on that board. Um, one of the things that the, the bill, or a couple of things that the bill does that kind of interrupt or uh, um, undercut this whole structure that's really good for artists. Okay, so the bill, um, I, I, you know, one piece of what it does is to talk about um, changing the rate standard in a way that will lower rates, and Colin has talked about that. But it does a lot of other things too. It, it sort of uh, aims to disrupt the whole rate setting um, uh, litigation structure so that the only evidence that the judges can look at is evidence of um, direct licensing that goes around the sound exchange compulsory license and uh, uh, is not subject to direct payment, is not subject to uh, non recoupability, is not subject to any sort of artist control. And that's just something that's you know antithetical, I, I think, to artist interests and is uh, uh, you know uh, not supportive of the artist community, if the only kind of uh, market that the judges can look at in setting a rate is uh, a direct license that says, okay, I can, f I can pay the compulsory license rate um, and I'll never have to pay more than that to, to get the music, but I want to go and enter into direct licenses with all these other individual labels to undercut that rate and I'm going to do that direct license, and then I don't have to pay the artist 50%. I don't have to have them paid directly, and there is an artist supervision over how the how the um, uh, artist payments are going to work out, or how any of the administration is going to go. That you know that that is not good for the artist community. Um, and you know the the other way in which the bill um, sort of undercuts the value of the compulsory license for artists is to uh, essentially create a new antitrust provision that says anytime you speak against or try to act against a direct license or point out the deficits of a direct license, you are vulnerable to being um, uh, found guilty of an antitrust violation. So, uh, you know, from the artist's point of view, even getting beyond the rates, there are a, a number of kind of snake pits in this bill that are bad for the artist community. Before we get any further deep into the weeds, I'm wondering if maybe we can zoom out a little bit. And Kurt, if you can help me with that. You know, again, imagine a child up here asking you this question. But terrestrial radio, from what I understand, it pays songwriters, it pays composers. In the digital space, performers are, are, are paid for their, for their work. How did this disparity begin, and, um, and why is it? Why? Well, um... I want to go back even one step further, which sure. is the purpose of copyright law, which is not to maximize revenues for Pandora or maximize revenues even for labels or musicians. It's to maximize the availability of creative works to the public. Uh, that's what this is really all about. And it's generally done by saying if, if it goes to royalty hearing at the copyright office, there should be a, there's a, a standard called 801B, uh, not to be confused with NCC 1701D, um, that, that is, says it should uh, provide a, set a rate that provides a fair income to the copyright owner and a fair return to the copyright user. And that has worked terrifically in low, in, in, um, now, I'm, I'm, I'll circle back to your sure. question. I'm sorry, I got distracted. Um, in, in terms of broadcast radio, there's never been a requirement to pay royalties to the, to the label or the performer because they make so much money off of the airplay, over the promotional value. As near as I can tell, the promotional value to you in the room who are musicians of airplay on Pandora is probably a hundred times what, you could, what you're getting from the check from Sound Exchange. If, if that airplay is concentrated in markets where you are where you where you are active, where you perform. Could you get a little closer to the microphone oh, as well? Thank you. So, th um, this this requirement to pay royalties was extended in 1998 to f digital forms of radio, and no one uh, in terms of webcasting. That's cable radio, satellite radio, and internet radio, and webcasters aren't objecting to that concept. 
Um, but they are, but in terms of cable radio and satellite radio, they're using the normal standard. They're using fair return to copyright uh, owners and fair income for copyright users. And that's all we're asking for in this new bill is the ability to get that. Can I address the history of the lack of a terrestrial sure. performance, right? That's the jargon that we use when we talk about the injustice that is the fact that over-the-air radio stations don't have to pay anything for the sound recordings. And there's a very simple explanation for why they don't have to pay, and digital radio does, and it's politics. Um, you know, music is concentrated in Nashville, LA, and New York. Digital radio is concentrated in a handful of states. Broadcasters are in every single congressional district. It's very hard to get any sort of legislation that requires them to, to do what and the rest of the world is taken for granted as a normal thing. You know, the United well, States. North is, Korea doesn't pay performance I'm royalties. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank <laughs> you. We're the I, only country aside from North Korea. So we're Thank you. I apologize for overstating the, um, the, <laughs> the extent of the injustice. So, so I think that's the political explanation. And, you know, there was a time when everyone um, sort of at this table was in favor of a performance, right, for terrestrial radio. You know, we said, look, at the elephant in the room is the fact that the $17 billion a year industry that is radio doesn't have to pay for music. You know, there was a time when everyone sitting at this table, I think, agreed with that. That has changed. That's one of the other big problems with the Internet Radio Fairness Act. It is, does not address that fundamental um, problem. And I also just want to take a quick note with the promotion argument. You hear that a lot. Um, if there was all this promotion going on, you wouldn't expect to see sort of revenues going to the record industry from the sale of recordings going down instead of up. And, you know, and... and and I am, the, the, the fact is that everything promotes everything, and it's not an excuse for, for not paying for something that belongs to someone else. Let me move it over to David Lowry really quick here. Uh, you're a lot as of people advocating I'd for artists here. To take about, I'm, I'm the, not only I'm the artist on the panel, I'm the only person here speaking against my financial interests. You should always pay attention to that, okay? I make a third of my income from Sirius, Clear Channel, and Pandora, okay? And I'm gonna piss them off right now, okay? That's what I've been doing for the last three months about, well, well, no, this bill, like the last six weeks, okay? So imagine, I'm, I'm also think I'm the only non-lawyer to have read this bill, so let's just say <laughs> this is the bill, and this much deals with the rates, okay? And then this deals with all of this crazy stuff crazy, crazy land stuff, okay? Like everything that doesn't have to do with rates. Like, for instance, I wanted to use this as a slide, but I don't know if you could see this. I used this at a talk last week, but it said, this is corporate broadcaster SOPA, censors free speech. And I'm going to read the passage that I think is the most egregious, although I can do this with about 10 different things in this bill. Nothing in this paragraph shall be construed to permit any copyright owners of sound recordings acting jointly or any common agent or collective representing such copyright owners to take any action that would prohibit, interfere with, or impede direct licensing by copyright owners of sound recordings in competition with licensing by any common agent or collective and any such action that affects interstate commerce shall be a contract, combination, or conspiracy in restraint of in restraint of trade in violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Act. Okay, so my question is, any copyright owners acting jointly? Okay, is that, so obviously that's aimed at people like Sound Exchange. It's probably aimed at Sony Music, but the way it's written, it says any copyright owners. So this could be a musical group. What if my musical group, Cracker, Camper Van Beethoven, decides that we want to write something about a direct licensing deal going on? We would be threatened with prosecution under the Sherman Act. What does that do to free speech, people? Any copyright owners, so is that, is that an alliance between two indie labels? Is that a band? What is it? Okay. What is impede? In the case of the American Association of Independent Musicians versus Sirius, it was simply doing that. It was speaking out. This section in this bill is to codify a lawsuit between Sirius 
and the American Association of Independent Musicians. That's what this is. This has nothing to do with rates. If you've been around Washington, D.C. long enough, you know what agency capture is. This entire bill, this is about rates. This is about agency capture. It's about the broadcast industry taking over the copyright board process. Kurt, you're trying to flag me down. What's, uh, yeah, what's I, on your mind? The, the point of that, that, as I understand, I think David's right that the language is imperfect. But what it says, what it's trying to do is say that right now in the DMCA, um, major labels have a, a specific right to collude and are exempted from any antitrust if they do collude to try and uh, deny uh, uh, direct licensing. What that paragraph is trying to do is prevent them from having a, a, an antitrust exemption. But if it was fair, it would prevent the other side from doing that too, yeah, and it well, does not. And I think it's actually really funny that a company like Sirius, which is a monopoly, is trotting out the Sherman Act, which is an antitrust act, to use against its opponents. Come on, people, this is Newspeak. Anybody ever read Orwell? <laughs> Newspeak, that's what this is. So in terms of... In I, terms I, of I, I just don't think Sirius is even involved in this bill. I've never heard any word of support for, for them. What do you think? Anyone beg to differ? Well, I'm not, I'm not I, sure. I mean, it's right here. You can look on my website and read it. I mean, it doesn't require a law degree to understand what it says. It, I mean, it really does. Is it, it, tur it turns the regime upside down because the the digital performance right and the compulsory license were set up where the 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 basic majority regime is the compulsory license, the one stop shopping. It's easy for services. They come, they pay, they register. That's all they have to do. They don't have to negotiate with thousands and thousands of people, and then the artists get the benefit of you know the certainty of the payment, the clarity, direct payment, and non recoupment. That's the that's the governing regime. But what David is talking about is trying to flip the regime and make the governing regime, you know, back into the dark old days of many, many, many um, individual negotiations between services and record labels and in ways that cut out the artists, cut out the direct payment to the artists, drive down the rates and, you know, reduce the pie for us. It, it's, it's like flipped reality. And if we don't have that in there, like for instance, 75 5,000 albums were released last year. What were 800 of them released by major corporations? The rest were released by bands directly or independent bands or small independent labels. The big, it, it would prevent us from speaking out if the major labels had advantageous licensing deals with Sirius and stuff like that. Plus there's a whole matter of that digital doesn't prevent payola. So we're already at a disadvantage. This hurts the little guy and censors free speech. That's all, right. all there is to it. It needs to go away. Colin, one person. I'd like to right. just address the... I got you. The, next. Right. next. Yeah. Colin, go for it. Okay. I just want to address the, the, the policy argument be, uh, behind the antitrust exemption that Kurt was talking about. Um, you know, he talked about the existing law allowing record labels to collude. Well, collusion happens when people can get together and set a price. That's what antitrust law is directed to. If, if you have competitors getting together and setting a price. Well, under the statutory license, record labels do, do not get to set the price. They don't even get to say no. The price is set by the Copyright Royalty Board. We participate in proceedings as to what the price should be, and we present evidence from competitive markets where there is competition as to what the price, you know, is what the market price should be. But at the end of the day, the government sets the price, not the record labels. And so, you know, one of the, you know, Kurt talks about the, you know, describes this provision as just eliminating the ability of record labels to collude. What he's really saying is that the bill gives give services all the benefits of a, of a rate court, which is you know, basically a cap on prices while eliminating the, or trying to eliminate the ability of record labels to actually participate in a fair way in a process to figure out what that rate is. So I just want everyone to understand, no one is saying that record labels should be able to collude. We have a rate right. court that sets the price. Michael. Okay, I, I, just a couple of quick points. Number one, there, there is no intent in this bill to step on anybody's free speech. If you look at the Congress, but, but, but let me finish. I didn't That's the way it's I, written. I, 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 I read the text. Right, text. Yeah, you can't just make but, shit up. Yeah, but let him finish this quick. But you can't make shit up. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Let me know. Let me know when I can talk. Can I talk now? 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, no, uh, so if you look at the sponsors of this bill, people like Senator Wyden, you heard from this morning, people like Congressman Chaffetz, they're, they're among the bigger free speech advocates in Congress, and the ones who led the fight against soap and pepper. So if there's anything in the bill that inadvertently does that, we can look at it and it, it, it gets fixed. There is a larger issue here, which kind of gets lost in the minutia of the copyright talk if you're not a copyright lawyer, which is you got a number of services that pay royalties at very low rates whether it's you know, cable or satellite or whatever. And then you have one service, which is internet radio, that pays royalty at royalties at a very high rate, right? So they're, they're, the, the system is discriminatory. That's a fact. So you know, Pandora, no, no, let me, like, when I'm done, you can talk. I'd love to hear you talk. Let me just finish. So Pandora is a publicly traded company, right? It is not a secret they're not making money. I think what, so that's our problem is that you currently have an unsustainable situation. And if I may add, and I, I've, the, the, I was, I've been somewhat taken aback by the vituperative nature of this debate, uh, you know, and, and Dave has been very articulate about why people downloading music and not paying for it is a bad thing. Pandora's one of the good guys, right? They pay hundreds of millions of dollars in royalties. They pay five or six figures in royalties to bands you've never heard of. And I'm talking to an audience full of music geeks. So that is the kind of service that we want to keep around. And the debate, the, the actual debate here isn't between should Pandora pay like at this level or should Pandora pay at that level. It's do you want royalty paying internet radio services like Pandora around or not? Because that's the choice. And I, I would hope that we could collaboratively come together and figure out how to make this business model a sustainable business model so that this business stays around and grows for years and years. Kurt, do you think that internet radio becomes, it becomes, you know, it goes into jeopardy, it becomes in peril if... Yes, it is definitely imperiled. For one thing, um, you know, uh, it was interesting to hear Michael talk. Internet radio plays far more independent artists and working musicians than any other form of radio. This is the form of radio you should most want to support. Um, it's got the ability to geo-target the songs it plays to the markets in which you, you perform, for example. Um, but, um, but right now, it's in big trouble. It's gotten virtually no venture capital investment in the last few years. There's a single webcaster, including Pandora, who can afford to market, to grow the audience. Um, a, a thriving internet radio segment with reasonable royalty rates that are good for everybody is the best thing that could happen to working musicians. This is, this is the thing you should be on, you know, on the side in favor of, not opposed to. If internet radio went away tomorrow, if Pandora went away tomorrow, there's still plenty of other choices out there. You can artists can stream their own songs off their own websites. This is a false argument. I would, but personally, what I want to say is that is that I would rather have free speech than the money. If you're going to get down to it, right? What's the I would rather have. I would rather like to preserve my right to free speech, to be able to negotiate, to speak about that, and to speak about with that with other artists. And I think it's completely disingenuous to right. say there's one well, service that doesn't pay this rate. There's 1,800 webcasters, and there's three people that pay the lower rate. Well, this is this is something. This is kind of a grander point that I'd like to get to. I know it sounds like everyone on this panel agrees that the artists need to be involved in this conversation, and maybe they're not. Would everyone? How how do we get? Musicians well, we're involved, not involved in this. Involved in a conversation if we're if our if we're threatened under the Sherman Act from actually having that conversation. That's what I'm getting at. Under right. the Sherman Act, we can't have that conversation. That is a sense that is censorship of free speech. But again, kind of pulling away from what the the thicket that we're in right now. You are an artist, and you are here yeah. speaking your voice. How like how how, well, does it, how do artists get in the act on this and and, and express themselves by letting people by basically either your I mean, you've got to be specific. Wait a second. I don't know. I, I want to get. <laughs> but, no, no, I'm getting. I'm going well, off in a different David, direction. David, uh, musicians just, are 50 percent of the Sound Exchange board, and correct. So yeah, they. I, mm -hmm. That's well, a pretty they, significant role. Thank you, Kurt. Um, no, that's true. I was. And unfortunately, they would be <laughs> muzzled under this agreement too. So. Yeah, I mean, I would say so. In terms of artist involvement through Sound Exchange, um, uh, Kurt is right, and thank you for pointing that out. And as Trish also said, you know our board is controlled half by artists um, and artist representatives. And that's a very real thing, and, and it makes sound exchange a sort of unique part of the music industry. The unions have also been very active on this issue. Um, the Music First Coalition is, um, is active on this issue, and that's a collection of a broad range of, of artist advocates as well as label advocates. You know, and, and so there are a number of different outlets, um, but we could use all the help we could get getting the word out. Yeah, and I, I yep. would add from the proponent side, 
you know, educate yourself about the issue. Like, look at their website, look at our website, figure out the facts. You know, David, I think, comes at it from a very principled point of view, and he says, you know, that there's this business paying artists over $100 million a year, and if it goes away, you know something, it goes away. Other artists may disagree. So and that's and, a different right. business model. It's that's capitalism. Good. Yeah, but I, I think this is a business model you, you may want to. They promote. could add another uh, ad. They could add another minute of advertising an hour and 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 raise their yeah, their uh, no, advertising no, I, 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 I guess revenue forty percent. Maybe they could. My sense is that a lot of people who listen to Pandora have gone away from broadcast radio, and the reason they've gone away is because of the ads. But 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 but, but I, I, I think it's incumbent on all of us like come together and figure out how to make this thing sustainable because right now it's not. Okay, well, it's a like, little hard when one side is being muzzled. I would love to open this argument to our everybody here. Let's all get in the act here. Who has questions uh, for our panel today? Um, do we have a microphone yet? <coughs> Gene is going to help you out. Hi. I'm a, You're on. I'm Elizabeth Frazee with Twin Logic Strategies. I'm a little, cons I'm a little confused by some of the vitriol against the 801B standard. Isn't that the same standard that the record labels use when they're purchasing rights from the music publishers and from the songwriters? I think it, I'm asking you, Colin. How are you addressing that to me? So I yeah. think that is the standard under current law. Um, my understanding is that in the past when there have been discussions of changing the standards, people are moving towards something other than that. Um, you know, I, I don't work for the record labels in that capacity, mm -hmm. the world of mechanicals is very, very different than the world that we live in. There's a much different history. A lot of it's built on direct licensing um, that is sort of in general. the shadow. It's 9.1 cents a track. Publishing. Yeah. It's 9.1 cents a track. It's very generous. But, but back to the point, I mean, we're not talking about setting a rate with this <coughs> legislation. I thought what the legislation did was create a standard that was a standard that had been used for 30 years. For well, it things like it says that you can't consider any anything that's happened before 2012. I'm not sure how you're going to set. I mean, that is there's a there's this a he who controls the past controls the future clause in this bill, and it one of the things is maybe you could elaborate on that. How we're not allowed to look at what. Uh, the judges are not allowed to look at. I mean, it's sort of like you're getting towards that standard, but then there's all these other things added to it, like you're not allowed to look at anything that happened before 2012, Trish, right? Do you want to yeah. get on that right there? I, I actually, I'd also like to hear a little bit from Kurt. One thing that we haven't heard about is the history of how we got to this point. And the CRB is, you know, every time the CRB has taken an action, Congress has had to step in to intervene or to encourage a private settlement. The Pandora rate, the pure play rate, was set. By, by a private settlement because the CRB rate was so high. So can you talk about that a little well, bit, Kurt? Thank you. Um, I well, guess it's, I, it's to Kurt. Uh, we may have the same view or different views. I'm not sure. <laughs> Kurt and I go way uh, back in this fight. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I'll, so, we, can we give Kurt a chance to answer uh, that one? Okay. That, was, that, was, okay. well, that was for him, so. Well, uh, in my opinion, the, the phrase uh, willing, what a willing buyer and willing seller would agree on is kind of gibberish. That it's, um, I'm going to go and try and, Boil this down to 20 seconds, but if I have an elderly cat I love, um, I'm not going to sell them for $2,000 because I love them, but the market, but you as buyers wouldn't pay 50 cents. So what's the, will, the rate that a willing buyer and a willing seller would pay for my cat? It's an unanswerable question. Um, the 801B standard, fair, maximizing the, the availability of works to the public, fair return for the copyright owner, fair income for the copyright user, that is interpretable. The CRB judges historically have struggled with this willing buyer, willing seller stuff, which I think is gibberish, and come up with rates that were so high, that were always over 100% of revenues. And that's why each time they've come up with that conclusion, there's had to be congressional intervention. Trisha, um, I wanted to get on the mic before we go to the next I'll question. Well, this. Yeah, so I'll, um, I guess, thank you. <laughs> um, so essentially, the Kurt has, you know, it's a, it's a sort of a nice um, image of the cat, and I feel badly for his cat. And the, it's a metaphorical cat. The, um, but in practice, this is how it's worked. The, under the willing buyer, willing seller standard, this copyright royalty board has looked at market evidence, looked at actual deals between record companies and digital music services, and said, okay, what, does, what do these tell us about the market for digital rights? 
And that's been the foundation of their decisions. In digital radio, under 801B, the judges have done this. They looked at the marketplace evidence. They, they said the market points to in this one direction. But based on these other factors and, and the, um, the serious in the last satellite proceeding, the one that was ended in 2006, this is basically based on the testimony of the two satellite companies' CFOs, we're going to set a different and much, much lower rate. So that's the way it's worked in practice. Um, in our view, the Copyright Royalty Board should look to market evidence. And so we think that's really the, the fair approach. Now, in ter on the revenue point and on Pandora, you know, and the pure play rates, um, it's right that the rates paid by the pure play services as well as the broadcasters for their simulcasting, you know, like iHeartRadio and all of those, those were all negotiated. Um, they were negotiated after, you know, and, and it is also right that they were sort of negotiated after the first webcasting proceeding was done. But here's what's sort of remarkable. The rates were not just for that term. They actually went all the way through the next term. So what we called webcasting three was fully settled with 99% of the market before the proceeding began. Those were all negotiated rates through 2015. Um, you know, and so the, the, the process essentially worked correctly there. Um, on the revenue point, it's very hard to just look at this sort of new industry and make any judgments about what's going to be successful and what's not. And, you know, and if you're running in an ad-supported business, you have to run advertisements. And, you know, and we're not going to judge what people do to try to generate revenue, and that's fine in their, their business. But I think, I personally think there's a huge amount of promise in this space, but it's sort of, I think we're, you know, sort of like assessing Facebook in 2004, or Google in 2000. You know, there's just a lot of growth. Let's ask another question from the audience. I need my Candy Crowley light to flash. To can, can, can I actually just jump in real quick? If, real quickly, because uh, I want to so make sure we have some questions. And, and the, the right standard question, you know, I'm not a musician, but I spend all my professional life working with musicians. And all of them say to me, I do this thing, I make this thing that is incredibly beautiful, incredibly valuable. It, it, it's full of my creativity and, 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 and is a wonderful creation. And then all around me there are businesses that are trying to make money off of my thing. Okay? That doesn't mean you hate the businesses that want to make money off your thing, but they're all out there making money off your thing, whether it's radio or whether it's Pandora or what it is. They're making money off the thing that I created. And what's wrong with a standard that says I should get a fair payment, I should get a fair market payment for my thing that I created that is my work, my talent, my creativity? That's, you know, that's what the rate standard is all about. It's just a fair market value for the thing that I created. And I, that, it's a simple is that that's not what the but the rate standard isn't what the vitriol is about the vitriol the vitriol to the extent there's any vitriol or the heat is is all the other things in the bill that take away you know the musician's right to speak up or to try to take away the musician's right to speak up for the compulsory license regime and the things in the bill that try to push the direct license regime to undercut those fair market okay. rates i'm going to make everybody hug before the end of the panel so uh, but <laughs> go on um, a, a few questions from the internet, and I'll try to synthesize and uh, rephrase, but uh, basically, what about the other bill? Um, there are two bills that have been put forward at this point, and the one that we've been talking about is the one that uh, changes the, the rate standard for Pandora and other similar services and takes it down to the satellite cable radius uh, uh, level. Um, and uh, what about the option of bringing them up? or? Um, is there some room for some compromise that allows Pandora to have a, a slightly lower, lower rate that's some sustainable in some way while bringing um, the other kind of services? To just, if we have some kind of consensus around the idea of parity in the broad sense, why does parity have to look like this? Michael, I'd love to hear that well, one no, from what you. The, what the other bill would do is essentially set all the other services under the same rate-making standard that internet radio is now under. So what you risk doing is then creating a whole bunch of non-sustainable business models, which is, is not good for you know, musicians, clearly. Um, oh, How do they do it in all of the other countries in the world except North Korea then? If they're not sustainable business models, I mean, just how do all pay the pay other countries in the world aside North Korea pay a performance royalty on terrestrial broadcast? Kurt, you have an answer and for that. Using typical principles of copyright law, mm -hmm. that's about three or four percent of revenues in most of those countries, which is sustainable. 
Okay. Who else? Wait. More than more than one question here. More than two questions, I'm sure. And this will, I think we only have a couple minutes left, so this will be our last one. Hi, I'm Brian Gantman. I'm with EMF. I know most of the people on the board. A couple of things I want to address and a couple of questions I want to ask. When it came to the last rate setting proceedings, and I know because I was one of the people who was dealing with Colin on the last night trying to get a deal done for the non-coms, when you talked about the market rates, it was actually that I believe Sound Exchange, though, was picking and choosing which rates would go forward, which ones would be allowed in the future rate setting proceedings. The question, I guess, towards Patricia is, if we're talking about the fact that under willing buyer, willing seller, the rates were so high that all these services would have shut down, or a lot of them would have shut down, and now there are lower rates. My question is, and I know that David, and I respect your passion, but if the rates are so high that none of these businesses are making money, and they go out of business, how does that benefit artists? And if you talk about how these businesses are all making money, and it should be shared with the artists. The fact is, Pandora lost $8.2 million in the first quarter, $5.4 million in the second quarter. It doesn't sound like Pandora is actually making business. Pandora goes under. People are not going to invest in this area. People are not going to be putting internet radios in cars. People are not going to invest in it. It's going to go away, and that's not going to benefit artists in any way, shape, or form. If you'd like to respond to that, and call in if you have any response to what I just asked. Go ahead. So, <laughs> I, I don't, I, I'm, <laughs> I don't, I'll, so I'll, I'll just say I don't think internet radio is going away. I think Pandora's prospects are, are improving, um, and you can look at what they say. You know, and, and look, it, they are disrupting an existing radio industry. Any disruptive business, um, it takes a little while to get its footing. Fact is, they're making you know hundreds of millions of dollars, but the potential is so much greater. It's hard to assess now. You know, they want to make a run for radio, but they're run only running two minutes of audio ads an hour. I think Dave's right. I mean, increase it by one minute, and suddenly they're there's... They're running one minute right now. They're not running two minutes an hour. They're running one okay. minute an hour. Um, but and, and part of that are ads for the Internet Radio Fairness right. Act to write your congressman, well, too. So. But, but maybe, maybe people don't want that. I, you know, again, I, I have no special knowledge of, of Pandora's <laughs> finances. But, but let me simply say, like, it's economics 101. If you, set up a, a, if you set up a context where a given business area can't make money, then that business area goes away. That's, uh, that's fundamental. And that's why, again, if you look in the rearview mirror, the road is like littered with all these failed web services that either went out of business or got out of the business. Because right now, you cannot, uh, the, the way the rules are set up, it is almost impossible to do well in that sector. And unless that gets changed, the, the sector goes away. That's how it works. That's, well, that's I mean, I could, set up a, I could set up a business that gave away free Mercedes, right? And, and, and then I say, hey, this, and the consumer could totally love it, and then, you know, but it doesn't make any sense economically and stuff like that. So I run to the government and mandate that the car dealers provide free Mercedes. That is essentially what you guys are doing. No, 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 no. That is what the problem is. It's your business model. Not our business model. Well, Suck right. it wait, up. Wait, 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 Capitalism. Wait, this is America. Wait, 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 like we're in the well, same if boat. If we did, then the, the quickest way to do that is to go privately to the record labels and the artists' unions and the publishing companies and s present your case instead of going to the nanny state to make them, I'm going to borrow that word right. even though I'm not a conservative, going to the nanny state to force us to fix their business model. What, if, if we ha really have an interest in it, then right. uh, collectively we will fix the problem. We're out of time. I've got to take my old cat and put him in the Mercedes and drive out of here. Um, I want everyone to Sorry. shake hands and give a hug. And thank you so much for speaking with us today, y'all. Thanks a lot.